Tonight's program, Opiates and Medicine, Where Are We, America, will be presented by Dr. Jeffrey Berger. Dr. Berger is a board-certified addictionologist and internist. He is a past medical director of Brighton Center for Recovery and the current medical director of Guest House, a Michigan-based based, lay-operated treatment center that cares for Catholic clergy and religious people suffering from alcohol, drug, and process addictions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Berger. <clears throat> Well, thank you. Let me turn this thing on and ask you, is it all right? Can people in the back hear me okay? Yeah. Good. Okay. So, you know, I was thinking a little bit about the, the presentation tonight, and I'd like just to, at my age, you like to re reminisce, you know. But I was thinking about what it was like when I first started uh, over 30 years ago in addiction medicine. Now, I'm not recovering from anything. I got uh, somehow invited to work at a treatment center, and that was the beginning of some wonderful things in my life. But uh, I remember at that time, uh, a guy by name Roman F. had just come through treatment center about uh, maybe half a year before I started working there. And Roman F. was a heroin addict. And he had a lie about his heroin addiction. He told everybody he was an alcoholic because if he had told people he was a heroin addict, he wouldn't have been allowed into treatment. Um, he went through a miserable withdrawal. Um, but, you know, Roman made it. And uh, Roman influenced the way I looked at heroin addiction right from the get-go. Roman was a strong force in recovering the Metro Detroit area for over 30 years. Uh, and uh, one of the first recovering heroin addicts in, in, in the Detroit area that I, certainly that I was aware of. I remember at the time that we had just, uh, just received some work from Mark Gold at Yale University who was talking about the catapress detox, which was something new, because before then you just sort of let heroin addicts sit in their bed and be miserable. And in fact, I remember my uh, chief resident, whom I love like an older brother, telling me, you know, there's not any really such thing as opiate withdrawal. It's all in their head. Uh, well, I, after I got to see about 100 of them, I said, well, it might be all in their head, but <laughs> there's something going on that looks remarkably similar from person to person, event to event, that goes on. So, you know, those are some thoughts. And that influences the way that I, I, I view things. So. Um, so that's me. I'm not owned by anybody. Um, so as we go on here, I want to just say something. You know, this is my perspective. I am uh, abstinence-based, drug-free oriented in, as far as recovery goes. Um, I tend to be rather passionate about that. Um, that's not to say that I don't respect other people, other points of view, and that uh, this, this reality works for everybody. So... Um, I think, though, just before we get started here, I, I'd encourage people to, um, these, this will be posted, this, this slide presentation will be posted on the Don Farms website within a week or two. Um, also, there is, an, um, there is a, a bibliography that also will be posted there, so um, you don't have to take notes or try and remember all these web addresses or anything, but um, for those of you who don't know this fellow, um, this is Bill White, who's probably one of the most respected names in uh, addiction, uh, at least sociology, I would say, at the present time. He wrote this book called Slaying the Dragon, which is uh, a history of addiction treatment in America, which is fascinating reading. Um, he looked at this, and this is a very, I think, a mind, uh, this is sort of a, one of those articles that's going to be a landmark article from the Harvard Review of Psychiatry from March and April of this year. And it's called The Long-Term Cost of opioid addiction. Um, to be frank with you, most of these names are not recognizable to me except for this one. This is Walter Lane, who's been around for years and years and years and years, and it's a very credible voice in addiction medicine. But this article has a very balanced view uh, of all, it looks at all of the um, articles that have been written about the trajectory, as Bill White calls it, of opioid dependency and addiction. Um, and points out the limitations in our present state of knowledge, of, uh, at least scientifically speaking, about how to treat opioid addiction and what uh, is going to produce recovery in any given individual. This, he has a very, for those of you who don't want to go through the um, long uh, scientific article, Bill White has a uh, posting on his blog that reviews this article and called the trajectories of opioid addiction. It's well worth reading. Uh, again, it's, it's a balanced look at what we know about opioid addiction at the present time. Um, 
So, what are we going to do tonight? Well, we're going to learn, I hope, learn some things, because I like, I like learning things. Um, we're going to look at the history of opiates in medicine. We're going to look at uh, and understand opioid addiction as a brain disease. We're going to look at issues in the use of opioids to treat chronic pain. And then we're going to look at medical treatments of opioid addiction. So let's go on. So if you look in the writings of Hippocrates and Galen, who were um, two physicians, Hippocrates was a Greek and Galen was a Roman, writing uh, Hippocrates wrote before Christ and Galen wrote about a century after Christ, um, you can find references to the use of opiates. In fact, you can find references to opiates as medicine back in the Sumerian papyri about 400 to 500 years before Christ. So opiates have been used in medicine for a long, long time. Um, they come from here, the poppy. Uh, this is pretty. This is uh, the poppy <laughs> flower without the petals. And if you let that thing dry out, this is what you get. And if you cut that thing open, this is what you get. These are poppy seeds, right? If you let the uh, if you take an unripe, one that's not dried out, and score it with a razor or a knife, you get this sap that comes out, this sticky sort of stuff. And if you collect it and let it dry, this is open. And what was it used for? It was used to treat headache, pain, diarrhea, insomnia. Those are the frequent things that it was used to produce, uh, used for it medically in centuries and centuries and centuries. Um, it could be taken orally. Uh, remember that the hypodermic needle was not invented until the late 1800s. Uh, or smoked, uh, which was often combined with tobacco after the discovery of the New World in 1492. Um, in the 1500s, a man by the name of Paracelsus put opium in alcohol, which is called, that mixture is called a, oops, a tincture of opium. And he named it laudanum. And laudanum comes from the Latin words laudare, which means to praise. So Paracelsus found this chemical to be a praiseworthy medicine, is what he was saying. And I think it's really interesting. Um, this contains about three grams of, of opium in it. If you do the conversions, it's 2,900, about three grams. And if you figure that maybe 10% of that is morphine, uh, talking about 30 milligrams of morphine, which is taken orally in, in an ounce. Uh, each fluid ounce contains that much. So here you have uh, this thing with a danger sign on it, the skull and crossbones, um, and they have uh, directions for giving it to a three-month-old. Uh, needless to say, we found out very early that opium in whatever form you took it was addictive. So this is one of the famous opium addicts. Anybody recognize this lady? This is Mary Todd Lincoln, the wife of Abraham Lincoln. And how about this fellow? Do we have any English majors in there? Okay, no. This is uh, Samuel Taylor College. In fact, a lot of the literati of the British uh, golden age of literature were addicted to opium as well. So didn't take physicians long to figure out that this thing was capable of producing addiction and that addiction ruined people's lives. Um, so they started looking at opium, and this began to happen in the early 1800s when the scientific revolution began to move into <coughs> medicine. And they began to think to themselves, well, maybe opium has things in it which would relieve pain, which would be useful, but not produce addiction. Now, that would be pretty cool, right? So they began to try and separate the different substances in uh, opium. And those substances we call, chemically, are called alkaloids. And over the years, they found two alkaloids which had analgesic properties. And those were morphine and codeine. So this is codeine. The name itself means poppy head. <coughs> It was uh, first isolated back in 1832. So this is not a new <coughs> right? 1832. Um, it's still available over the counter in Canada's 222 tablets, having about uh, 
eight milligrams of codeine in them. Uh, and codeine over the years was improved. Hycodan, which was one of the first improvements on codeine, was first synthesized in 1920, but wasn't marketed in the US until 1943. So think about this for, I think there's a number of significant things here. One is that Hypodan, if you look at all these names that we're going to be talking about through the night, they all are marketing names. So when you see Hypodan, what do you think of? Yeah, high coding, right? Something better than coding. Um, it was synthesized in 1920, but there was a 23-year delay in marketing it in the United States. What was going on in 1943? World War II, right. So they were running short of uh, narcotics, and the need was to be able to, and the pharmaceutical industry took advantage of that need to be able to start marketing this drug at this point in time. This drug has morphed over the years. Hypodan lost its trademark corpse years and years and years ago. And it's good, but it was never discontinued. Anybody know what the generic name of this is? Hydrocodone. So Lord Cab's Vicodin are, are the present day descendants of Hycodin. Again, these are not new drugs, these are old drugs. Um, this is morphine, and it's really not a whole lot different than coding in its chemical structure. It only comes from this poppy, a pavrosomiferum. And it, there are different kind, different breeds, different strains of this that can be bred to low morphine content or high morphine content. The low ones have about 0.004% morphine, and the, the high content ones can have up to 26% morphine by weight. That's a lot. Morphine was given its name after the Greek god of dreams, Morpheus, and this is a picture of Morpheus. Throughout the 1800s and the 20th centuries, people learned that morphine was addictive. They decided to try and improve morphine. And by 1920, two different drugs, each possessing analgesic property, had been developed. One was hydromorphone, and the other was diacetylmorphine. So this is hydromorphone. It was marketed uh, in, it was synthesized in 1924 and marketed in 1926, so relatively short time after it was uh, synthesized, brought to market. You can see that this probably didn't undergo any randomized controlled trials to demonstrate its efficacy. It was given the name of dilaudid, di meaning twice, and lauded, of course, being praiseworthy, so this is twice as praiseworthy as anything else in the market at the time. Um, and it was brought out as a cough suppressant as well as an analgesic. I would have been interested as a cough suppressant. What was going on back in the early 1900s? The, the disease that was the leading cause of death in people the age of 18 to 25 years old. Tuberculosis, right. Practically unknown today, but tuberculosis, of course, characterized by the cough, so this was taking advantage of the need for something to suppress cough. Um, one of the things that it looks there's a warning here, dilated may be habit forming and requires a narcotic prescription. We're going to come back to that a little bit later. I just want to point that out right now. Now, diacetylmorphine was, was first synthesized in 1874 and marketed in 1898 by the Bayer Chemical Company, you know, the same people that bring the aspirin. It was marketed. Now, this was a little bit different than any of the opiates up to this time. <clears throat> Any narcotics up to this time and for many, many years afterwards were marketed towards the medical professionals, so the pharmacists and the physicians. Uh, what, and that's why they, most of them had Latin and Greek names because that's the language that uh, most of the physicians spoke at the time was Latin, a unifying language across a variety of different languages. Uh, so, but this is not a Latin name. This just has the word hero in it. It was marketed as an over-the-counter cough suppressant in 1898. And it was marketed directly to the public, not to medical professionals. Now, the consequences of that were enormous. By 1914, opiate addiction was so widespread that there was an international consortium that got together to pass laws in all the member countries to regulate the possession, the sale, the distribution of narcotics. And here in America, this was the 
Harrison Nar Narcotics Tax Act, Tax Act in 1914, which, which made everybody who imports, produces, manufactures, compounds, deals in, dispenses, distributes, or gives away opium or cocoa, these, or any compound manu uh, manufacture, salt, derivative, or preparation thereof. They had to apply for a, um, a license from the federal government and, and pay tax on the license. So the federal government at this point is using its taxing uh, powers to restrict the uh, possession, distribution, and sale of narcotics in the United States. And by putting this into effect, this worked for many, many, many centuries, uh, many, many decades. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this law also made it illegal to treat opiate addiction with an opiate. And that law is still on the books. And I don't know, never heard of anybody being prosecuted for disobeying it, um, but that law is still on the books. And uh, you'll see uh, some of the consequences of that later. So in looking at this, uh, these are two different copies. This one's Papaver Bracteatum. And uh, this is a different kind of copy and has a different mixture of alkaloids in it. One of the alkaloids that it's rich in is an alkaloid called thebane. Thebane occurs naturally. Uh, thebane was named after Thebes, which was a city of ancient Egypt and was actually the center uh, for the commerce of opium uh, in the ancient worlds. Um, it, Thebane has no medicinal properties at all. However, it's very, been very, very useful to the pharmaceutical industry as a base from which to manufacture semi-synthetic opiates. So, if you look at where we are right now, we have, in opium, we have morphine, codeine, and thebane. From morphine, you get hydromorphone or dilaudid. You get heroin. From codeine, you get hydrocodone or dricodin. Thebane has three different groups that come from it. One is a group one we think of as very, very highly addictive narcotics, oxycodone and oxymorphone. Uh, group two are the so-called mixed agonist antagonists, nalbutrophine and buprenorphine, and we'll talk more about uh, buprenorphine later. And group three are naloxone and naltrexone, and these are complete opiate antagonists. They possess no opiate activity at all but they're used medically, and we'll touch on that a little bit later as well. So just kind of getting an idea where all these names and, and structures come from. So let's look at opiate addiction as a brain disease. This man was incredibly important for the, our science of addiction medicine. He uh, lived in the 1900s. He, he did most of his active work in the 1950s. Uh, this was an article that he put, uh, published in Scientific American uh, in 1956 called Pleasure Centers in the Brain. Uh, at that point in time, uh, he was looking to see whether some of what prior to this time had been thought of mostly as spiritual or mystical experiences, such feelings such as love, fear, pain, and pleasure might have some kind of biological <coughs> correlate. Uh, he wanted to see specifically if there were areas of the brain which, when stimulated, <coughs> caused the animal to exhibit seek, uh, seeking behavior rather than avoidance behavior. So this is the animal. Now he did a series of different experiments, and I'm just going to talk about the, the last one of them, which was the most uh, fascinating, I, in my mind, one. Um, this is the animal. This is the electrode here. This is the wire hooked up to an, a battery or some kind of external power source. The electrode is implanted into the animal's brain. Uh, the animal is allowed to recover it and let back in the cage. Now, in the cage, they have built this lever. And the way this works is that eventually, uh, as the animal patters through the cage, it's going to press on this lever. And when it does, it's going to activate the current which flows down the electrode and, and it's going to turn on that part of the brain. So what happens? <coughs> Well, they put it all together, and I, I used to think that this was, um, you know, scientific romance at its best, but I was disappointed. I got a chance to talk to uh, one of the gentlemen who was actually working in the labs who showed up for treatment at Maple when I was working there um, for alcohol addiction. But uh, what he told me is that they all went off to lunch. Okay? 
when they came back, this is the number they saw on the counter, 5,000. So they figured we must have, our digital counter must be broken. And they turned around and looked at the animal, and there the animal is going like this. Until it developed carpal tunnel syndrome. <laughs> I need a surgery. No. <laughs> it, actually, what happened was they kept doing it until it got exhausted and then fell over. And when it came to, it went right back to doing this. So this looks suspiciously like there's something happening when that part of the brain is stimulated that the animal is interested in. This is the part of the brain that Dr. Olds was working with. We have it in our brains. Okay? And this black structure here is called the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. Um, now, there's a number of interesting things as far as opiates go here. If you look at the brain, there's this area here called the periaqueductal gray area. That is the area of the brain at which opiates exert their analgesic effect. So their pain relieving properties have to do with their activity in the neurons in this area. Okay? These neurons operate by new receptors, and drugs which activate new receptors activate this area of the brain. This area of the brain over here, there's a spot of neurons called the locus ceruleus, uh, and next to it is a nucleus paradigm and cellularis can barely pronounce, let alone right out on the slide. But these two areas are incredibly important because that's the area that produces alcohol, uh, opiate withdrawal. So these are two different places of the brain that these things are being uh, activated. This is produced here, will produce, giving it here will produce uh, analgesia. Over here, when it's chronically stimulated, by mu agonists because these are mu receptors here, so drugs which activate mu receptors. When you do it regularly for a period of about a month and then take it away, then you begin to get withdrawal. So we have drugs which activate mu receptors responsible for producing analgesia and also withdrawal. Up here in the ventral tegmental area are also mu receptors. So when you get drugs which activate the mu receptors, then you also activate this mesolimbic dopamine pathway, which is the center that has that produces addiction. Why does it produce addiction? It's a powerful center. I don't think we know everything about it yet. It has to do with the connections here in the amygdala, which is part of, part of the brain of the limbic system, it's called, where your brain processes emotional uh, uh, events and where emotional regulation takes place. Uh, so if you're feeling anxious and you get one, uh, take some, an opiate, by and large, uh, most people will experience a reduction in anxiety. Uh, this part of the brain over here is called the nucleus accumbens, <coughs> and that group of nerves is probably responsible for the uh, euphoric feeling that the drugs produce. And then this also projects up here into the prefrontal and frontal cortex, which are the areas of the brain responsible for planning and making judgment. So you have drugs, essentially, opiates, when they come here, they activate the system right here, they activate the whole system, and they produce addiction by their actions on all these different parts of the brain. One of the interesting things then that, that, that I began to see as I began working in addiction medicine was that it was impossible to divorce a drug, an opiate in terms of you could not talk about its analgesic effects without also talking about its withdrawal producing properties without also talking about its addictive properties. And when we began uh, working uh, with people who came in for treatment and wanted to be taken <coughs> off of opiates, who had pain problems, uh, I wasn't quite sure when I started out whether that was actually going to be possible or not. Now, when I started doing this, treatment centers were still operating under 30 days for everybody. So we had a little time to work with people. And I'll share what my experiences were at that time. Um, but why is pain so important to deal with at this point in time? Well, one of the reasons is because of the number of deaths from opiate overdoses. So this is a slide that shows that you put this curve on top of this curve and you get the blue ones here. 
Um, the Latin, I could only find data from 2011 that the government's about uh, 14, about three years, four years behind at this point in time. The latest numbers that I saw from the CDC say that 48 people per day die of opioid overdose. And that's huge. Imagine if 48 whales per day were washing up on the beaches of California or Florida. Where is the hue and cry about what's happening in America today? And it's only really part of the prescription opioid epidemic because many other drugs are being prescribed that are also causing overdoses, predominantly benzodiazepines, and mixed benzodiazepines and opiates. <clears throat> so where did it all begin, all this pain relieving stuff? That this is one of the one of the engines that is driving the current opioid epidemic. So I want to talk about it for a little bit. In 1986, Dr. Russell Portman co-authored an article about treating chronic malignant pain, non-malignant pain, and proposed something new. What he proposed was that the chronic use of opiates in this group of patients was safe and didn't have any complications, such as addiction or death from overdose. He had gotten his ideas from a one-paragraph quote-unquote study in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this was actually just a letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what it said was they had looked at a, a couple hundred patients admitted to the hospital and then followed them to see how many of those patients developed an addiction. And these patients were all patients treated with opiates in, in the hospital. So they had come in, for example, with appendicitis and been given opiates in the hospital and then were sent home. And what the, the author said was that relatively few of these people, fewer than 1%, ever developed an addiction. Okay. So he did some research, and his exhaustive research consisted of 38 patients <laughs> treated for chronic pain with narcotics, which he used to prove his idea that narcotics were safe and published it in Pain in 1986. Using these two pieces of literature, Dr. Portnoy pushed the idea that the age old wisdoms about narcotics were wrong. He said that you didn't have to use the lowest dose possible, you didn't have to prescribe for the shortest time period possible, you could prescribe as much as it took for as long as, it, as was necessary without any kind of complications at all. And a whole generation of physicians, this is in 86, right? So that's uh, 30 years ago, almost, 29 years ago. A whole generation of physicians were taught that opiates could be used to treat chronic pain in patients safely, without side effects and without risk of addiction. This was one of the other engines driving the opiate epidemic. It was a regulatory agency saying that we needed to address pain which I think is a noble goal, and I certainly ascribe to that 100%. Um, it just so happens, though, that what's easier and less expensive to do, if you come in with an accident, um, is it easier to simply prescribe opiates, or is it easier to have some psychological consequence, counseling about what happens to you as a result of your accident, give you physical therapy to help rehabilitate whatever can be rehabilitated, and for people to take the time to care about you. And you can see where the economic engine drives the use of opiates, again. And then the third thing, third engine, was the pharmaceutical company, which responded to all of this with just an explosion of opiates. Now, this was an interesting drug. Fuxublimase was brought out when I was still had black hair. <laughs> it was a drug used for surgery, and it was a, it's a very, very potent narcotic. And for that reason, the, ana the anesthesiologist liked it because you could give just a little tiny bit. You didn't have to give a whole lot of fluid in order to give it. Um, and it perked along and perked along and then lost its patent in the mid-1990s. This is the generic name for that drug. And within a few years, you have all of these products. I mean, you have polypops, you have tablets, you have sprays, you have nasal sprays, oral sprays, you have patches, you got all kinds of stuff, um, all with this product fentanyl. In fact, it even reached a point. This drug was brought out in 1914, this is oxymorphone, and it was given the name Numorphan. 
So the marketing at that time appealed to the appealed to the um, physicians that this was a new morphine, right? Which implied an upgrade on the morphine molecule. It was withdrawn in 1972. What was going on in 1972? What's that? Vietnam. 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 And all the vets coming back from Southeast Asia, and a number of them had heroin habits. So we experienced another opiate epidemic in that time frame. And because it was highly addictive, it was withdrawn from the market at that point in time as part of the war on drugs. Okay? But in the push of the 1990s and early 2000s, it was remarketed as Opana. So this trade name is opiate analgesic. So you've lost the desire to appeal to the physician as an improvement on morphine. What you want to push it as is an opiate that's suitable for analgesic properties. So what happened as a result of all this was the painkiller explosion and tremendous deaths of people dying from opiate overdoses to the point in uh, 2012, Dr. Portney had a had an interview with people in the Wall Street Journal saying that he had had second thoughts about his career. What he said was that he initially had proposed that they could be used safely. In 1996, he had helped write consensus statements for the American Pain Society and many other prestigious organizations and by embedding his ideas about pain medicine and chronic, uh, treating chronic pain, chronic pain patients with opiates. In December 2012, faced with the evidence of the opiate epidemic, what he said was, based on the standards of today, my prior years of teaching were, quote, misinformation. I mean, this is tragic. This is 25 years of educating physicians of falsehood. He said there was no data on the effectiveness of long-term opiate prescribing for chronic And that's the house of cards that the current epidemic has been built on. All the time, he is receiving funding from pharmaceutical companies. So where are we today? You know, last year when I gave this talk, the only thing I had to talk about was the hydro, which we were all fighting and which came out anyhow. In the interim year, we've had Tarquinique, we've had Hysingla, and now we got Extampsa also coming out. And the, the, the uh, drug pharmaceutical industry continues to produce high potency narcotics um, that are highly, in my mind, highly dangerous. Um, this drug and this drug were marketed despite um, uh, recommendations from the panels which evaluated them not to market the drugs. They still are marketed anyhow. Um, there were and you'll see some, and some of this is uh, real schizophrenia. What I think of it is, is the fact that the mechanisms that were put in place to guard us against opiate addiction have failed. Um, and we have a kind of schizophrenia going on now. On the one hand, we have the FDA approving more and more narcotics, uh, more and more potent narcotics. And on the other hand, we have the government acting to do things like uh, Rick Snyder did last fall when he okayed the, uh, the EMS crews to carry an Arcan in there in their uh, medication kit so they could uh, reverse opioid overdoses immediately. Uh, there's, the FDA is also doing things like rescheduling hydrocodone combination products from Schedule 3 to Schedule 2. And that's, uh, what that means is that people are no longer able to call in prescriptions for these drugs like the Vicodin or Lortex. They have to be handwritten. Uh, they can't be renewed. They, they have to be hand uh, delivered to the pharmacy. Uh, so that's trying to tighten up the prescribing of it. Uh, they also placed tramadol, which was marketed originally as a non-opiate analgesic, but one that activates new receptors and therefore acts like an opiate, uh, finally scheduled it as a control substance in the schedule for it. And prior to that, it was not considered a control substance at all. Uh, so there, there's this kind of schizophrenia going on right now that you'll see itself playing out again more and more as the uh, years unfold. I, I don't see any signs of this resolving in the near future. Um, 
the issue of chronic pain disorders and addiction in my mind is a complex one, and I want to present here um, my experience and my reflections. Okay, and I'm not saying this is a, a cookie cutter approach that's going to work for everybody. I've been, um, however, in my present job, when I have patients in treatment for 90 to 150 days, and we have physical therapy available to help chronic patients, I don't have a single patient that I need to continue on chronic opioids. They all make it off the opioids, and we all do well. Um, even when we had people for 30 days, about 90% of people would say, I feel just as good or better off my, as a, off my opioids as I did when I was taking them. So that, that's a huge surprise. Uh, again, I see a skewed population, I know, but uh, I began to think about what would be the reasons for my experience and, and my observations. Well, the first thing is, is that opiates have side effects. And if you look at these side effects, none of these are euphoric. <laughs> They're all unpleasant. So people get things that, that make them feel bad from the opiates themselves, the nature of addiction is not to connect negative consequences with the substance you're using. And so it becomes very difficult for people to say to themselves, well, maybe my headache is due to my narcotics. I mean, my doctor gave me Vicodin for my migraines, and how is it possible that the drug which took away my headache is not producing headaches? So people just don't put these together a lot of times. <clears throat> the second thing that I observed was that uh, withdrawal symptoms also are not pleasant. And uh, over the years began to understand opiate withdrawal as a syndrome, which means a collection of different symptoms. And a lot of these are due to dysfunctions in different places of the brain. Uh, but none of them are pleasant. And I find especially interesting the fact that muscle aching and soreness and bone pain are part of withdrawal. So if you're started on opiates for back pain, and you take them for three years, and then try to get off of them because you're tired of taking them, and you begin to have pain in your back again, do you say to yourself, this is withdrawal from my, my opiate? No. You say, it's that darn back pain, I need, my, I need my Vicodin still, or I need my Oxycontin still. And the reality is, is that some, some of the times, this is no longer due to the original pain. This is due to um, this is due to the withdrawal pain instead. And then we know there's a, an interaction between depression and pain. If you're pain, if you're in chronic pain, you're likely to be depressed. When you think about it, you're living in pain, which is not pleasant. Oftentimes, you've lost your job. You're not functioning well in society. You're interpersonal interactions suffer. Your sexual life may suffer because of the pain. All of these things happen, and they cause depression. What we know is that people on chronic opiate treatment are prone to develop depression, up to 80% by Grin, Spoon, and Bilecar's studies. And the second thing is that opiates themselves, if you try and treat the depression produced by the opiate, or the depression that's there because of chronic pain, opiates themselves tend to blunt the effectiveness of any antidepressant medications. So you have a vicious cycle of depression worsening pain, which is worsening to depression, which worsens pain, which worsens depression. It just goes on and on and on and on. <coughs> there is an in another interesting phenomenon that goes on, and I don't think this happens more than 10 or 15 percent of the time, but when you see it, it's actually quite dramatic. And that's the fact that giving opiates chronically can actually increase pain. Now it does it by this mechanism, and I'm not going to go through here because we've got too much time. The only thing I want to point out is this fascinates me. The CCK is one of the hormones involved in facilitating pain transmission by opiates. That's the drug that, that's the hormone that produces, makes the gallbladder contract after a fancy meal, fatty meal. And I'm still trying to figure out what that hormone is doing up there facilitating pain. So I think that's one of my correct questions for God if I ever get up that high enough. <laughs> <laughs> but what this hypersensitivity to pain results in is the following two things. Number one is hyperalgesia, and that means that small pain events are interpreted as big pain events by your central nervous system. 
So stubbing your toe feels like breaking your leg. Getting a cut on your arm feels like someone eviscerated you with a knife. Okay? That's hyperalgesia, opiate-induced hyperalgesia. And normally non-painful sensations are interpreted as painful sensations. So a cloth on your arm, a blanket on your foot, um, there are all kinds of different, but are someone stroking your skin, things which are normally non-painful can be, can be interpreted as painful or at the very least dysphoric. Okay. And a solution, if you're not thinking of this, of, this, of this particular side effect, is of course is to increase the opiate, which makes the pain worse. So you increase the opiate again and make the pain worse. The solution is get rid of the opiate and let these things reverse. And what we noticed when we had people in treatment for 30 days was that a lot of this central sensitization that goes on reverses itself within 30 days. So that people tolerate pain much, much better. And that's where we got that 90%. I'm better or no worse than I was on pain. It starts my pain is when I'm off my narcotics. <coughs> Another uh, consideration here is that it is not normal to live without pain. I'd like to give you a, a little story out of my own background. Uh, about four years ago, my father fell in, in at home. So I get the call, you know, at 10 o'clock at night. And normally that wouldn't be dad, except my dad has polio and he also has very severe spinal stenosis. So he normally walks like this, which is probably the reason that he stumbled in the first place. And the, the polio means that a break is going to be uh, significant because it's going to make his muscles very, very weak while he's recuperating, waiting for his bone to heal. So he went into the emergency room, um, and then from the emergency room went to the nursing home and spent about four to six weeks in the nursing home and was having a terrible time. He was in pain a lot, uh, and we got called into the you know, for one of the Stanley conferences, and they said, you better start looking for some kind of uh, long-term assisted living or something to put your dad in, because he's never going to get home. So we're, I'm kind of pondering this in my head. I have a hard time accepting this. And uh, so I, I came in a couple days later, and I'd been working a little bit later that day, so I came in probably 9 o'clock at night to visit dad. And he's, um, he's laying down in his bed, and he looks really comfortable. I thought, oh, that's neat. And I thought, he's laying down in his bed. Well, maybe I haven't laid down in the bed in 10 years. Because every time he lays down in the bed, he gets terrible pain from spinal stenosis. He sleeps in a chair where his knees are like this, so he doesn't have to straighten his back. So I said to him, Dad, why are you laying down in bed? He said, I don't want to feel good. good. So I said, well, what are they giving him? He said, well, they gave him a Vicodin a couple of hours ago. So this is a story. He had this kid in Vicodin at 9 o'clock at night. Falling asleep about 2 o'clock in the morning, he'd wake up and he'd have the most severe pain in his back. He'd go back. And he'd be in pain for until he gave more pain pills. And it, it just cycled and cycled. So what, what, what we did was say, you know, Dad, you need to give up your pain pills at night. And you need to start sleeping in the chair or at least get them fixed to bed so that you're in a natural, but it's a natural position for you. He was home within three weeks, and he's been at home for the last four years. So what was happening? The opiates that they were giving him were erasing his ability to figure out what was causing him to, his progress to go so slowly. It's not normal to live without pain. Pain provides boundaries and provides learning for us. Well, it's a fascinating book if anybody wants to read it. And the last thing I've already alluded to is that the use of opiates, in, in other words, erasing pain, physical pain, does not in and of itself address all the issues that have to do with recovering from an injury or illness that produces debilitation and that produces disability. There are a host of psychological factors uh, and other physical factors that can be worked with that opiate use does not touch at all. Uh, this book has a very nice chapter. This is Jerome Groupman, who was an oncologist, and what a, a, a real um, payoff chapter in this book is one where he talks about his own experience of back pain. Uh, and when finally confronted by a physical therapist who had the courage to tell him 
that he was embroiled in, in, in worshiping his pain rather than seeking the way out. So the last thing we're going to do then is talk about the medical treatment of addiction. Now, I'm not going to talk about methadone. Um, closest I got to that was when I was working in the Naval Group, Mike Boyle was my, my comrade at the Naval Group. And Mike had just about given up on opiate addiction. He said, Jeff, maybe we should go to this methadone treatment. And I said, well, yeah, I'll say goodbye, Mike, and you can do it. And he said, and he never did it. So, uh, so um, we, that's about as close as I ever came. And methadone, as you know, was one of the may or may not know. It was the first exception to the uh, Harris and Narcotic Tax Act that forbid <coughs> the use of opiates to treat opiate addiction. Dola Nyslander brought it out um, after showing that, that they could restore people to, quote, functional life, that is, they could get a job and maintain relationships if they took a substitute for the opiate that they were taking care of or marketing. Um, what I'm going to concentrate on instead is the drugs that are growing increasingly ever more common than methadone at this point in time. One of them is Suboxone, and the other is Vivitrol. Um, so again, here's our little thing. This is Thebane. There's three different transformations. It becomes norbuprenorphine, and then a fourth transformation. Thebane is transformed into buprenorphine. That's right here. This drug is uh, has both uh, uh, both uh, activates opiate receptors and also um, inactivates opiate receptors. So it's a little complex in its pharmacology. It contains, Suboxone itself contains both buprenorphine and naloxone. So why is naloxone? Uh, this is buprenorphine. It was developed by Reckitt in the 1980s and it was a flock of the payments. <coughs> It was reintroduced in 2003 after Reckitt got the U.S. Congress to amend the Harrison Narcotic Treatment Act, the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act, to allow buprenorphine status along with methadone to be used to treat opiate addiction. And these were the talking points. Number one is a partial agonist. Number two, it had a fat affinity for the new receptor. It had a long half life. The addition of naloxone would prevent or discourage abuse of the drug. and I find this particularly interesting. Slow dissociation of buprenorphine from the receptor results in a long duration of the effect and also confers another advantage in that when the drug is withdrawn, an abstinence syndrome is rarely seen because of the long time taken for the drug to come off the receptor. Okay? So that was the reasoning that went into releasing in the marketing of, 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 of uh, buprenorphine. Now, let's take that point by point. Partial agonist means that you shouldn't be able to get high on so I want to read you this. Anybody ever go to Arrowhead here? Let's see somebody say yeah, okay. So Arrowhead is a, a, a source for um, the vaults of Arrowhead contain multiple user data as long as all the scientific evidence about uh, about drugs. This is what one of the things they have about Suboxone is a user experience. It says I was prescribed eight milligrams of Suboxone per day, which is quite expensive without insurance and went home as quick as I could and slid a pill under my tongue. So this is when they still were doing tablets. Within 40 minutes, my withdrawal symptoms were completely gone, and I was in such a great mood, and I had so much energy. What does that sound like? But this sure did and does feel like being high on an ice dose of Vicodin. I got home and just grabbed the lawnmower and mowed the grass, came inside and said to myself, now what with all this energy? I called my wife, not telling her how high I felt, Telling her it's the greatest drug in the world, my withdrawal <coughs> symptoms are gone. I just took another four milligrams about two and a half hours ago and feeling very high. Hard to concentrate and even type this, and I've read so much that this doesn't get you high. A friend said it got him a little high the first time and then just felt normal afterwards, so who knows, but right now, this is unreal. So, my experience has also been that if you talk to people on Suboxone, um, most of the people who take it do not experience the same kind of high that they will experience on heroin or Vicodin or oxycodone or oxymorphone. It is not that unfortunate. However, most people will tell you they get energy from it. And most people will tell you uh, that their behaviors on it still are remarkably like that when they are using drugs. And that they're very concentrated and fixed on the suboxone occupies their thinking and their thoughts. And if you give Suboxone, 
of buprenorphine to someone who's never taken an opiate before, it is indeed an addictive drug. There was, it was marketed in England in the 1960s under the brand name of Temjizu. And there was a Kenny's epidemic in the 1960s and early 1970s in England uh, because of people, young kids, who were using uh, buprenorphine for the first time as an introduction to opiate and that opiates. And in that sense, in the opiate naive person, buprenorphine is experienced as euphorogenic uh, and is addictive that way. So we were also told that it had a tight affinity for the new receptor, which means that it should block other opiates from acting. And that's true. And I hear that, heard that consistently from patients during the time that I was using buprenorphine or suboxone. But you only get that blockade if you're using the full dose, which is 16 milligrams. And that means that any time you begin weaning people off the drug because they would like to get off of the drug and not stay on it for all of their life, they begin to get increased risk for getting high the drugs that they slip. And it's only, blockade is only effective for opiates. You don't block alcohol or Xanax or weed or cocaine or anything like that. And it only blocks it if you take it a So there are some qualifications of that. Uh, they told us that long half-life means you only needed a dose once a day, which means you'd be able to start breaking some of the drug-taking habits when you're taking drugs every three or four hours a day. Um, well, in, in reality, most people take it at least two times a day. And in reality, what I experienced with my patients is a number of them had to really work with them to get it down to from three to four to five times a day down to twice a day. So the habits still persist. The other drug in it is naloxone, um, which was man manufactured by Santio Pharmaceuticals and introduced in the 1960s as a treatment for opiate overdose. Remember, this was the um, second opiate, opiate, opiate epidemic in America. This was the drug uh, which brings people back from an, from an opiate overdose. The, the idea of combining it uh, was that you would be able, in case people tried to abuse the drug by melting the tablet or the, or the film and then uh, putting liquid in, injecting it, that the blocker, the naloxone, would block the receptors and uh, the buprenorphine would not be experienced at all. Um, well, discourages is, is probably accurate, but the, in, patients have been described in the literature <coughs> Well described, that people can become addicted to IVs of so it doesn't work all the time. And um, okay, so the last point that they talked about was that the slow dissociation of buprenorphine doesn't means that it doesn't have any kind of withdrawal symptoms. So I want to read this is again from Arrowhead. Um, but there is a downside to this drug. The stuff has, without any doubt, worse withdrawal than heroin. Withdrawal feels different and lasts about four weeks. That's short in my experience. My doctor says this is not uncommon, but still on the bad side of the withdrawal spectrum. The first week of withdrawal, this was after tapering down to one milligram. So one milligram was about that. Was hell. No sleep at all for the entire week. I spent seven days in bed sweating rivers and changing clothes constantly. Anxiety was unbearable. All I wanted in the world was a Xanax. After that week, I started to regain my ability to sleep. Well, it was a full month before I could readily sleep through a night without sweats. I ended up getting seriously into other drugs and my desire to stay away from opioids. My ketamine and DXM usage was seriously dangerous and very irresponsible. Every day or night for three to four months after quitting Subutex, either this heavy dissociative use or the withdrawal itself triggered my first manic episode. What a nut I became. But that's another story altogether. Anyway, six months later, I relapsed on a whim, crashed a car, and got back on Subutex. And here I am, unsure if I will ever try to quit buprenorphine maintenance again. I'm alive, I go to work every day, I'm safe and numb, and I don't know where to go from here, and I don't like where I am. So what we discovered was that getting people off buprenorphine was one heck of a task. Very few people need it. Now, one of the reasons, another reason why I believe in abstinence-oriented 
uh, recovery is possible for opioid addicts is because I worked for many, many years with the Health Professional Recovery Program. And the Health Professional Recovery Program in, in Michigan, which monitors doctors and nurses and pharmacists and other licensed professionals in recovery, um, does not allow the use of chronic opioids. Okay? It does not even allow medication assisted treatment. And so what I saw was that people can recover and enter stable recovery when they have the proper amount of support. And, and HPRT generally is about three years for most people, sometimes two, sometimes five, it depends on. But when people have the support they need, the group therapy, the involvement in AA, the structure and the accountability, addictions of monitoring, uh, therapy sessions, uh, they can make it into sustained recovery from opioids. Uh, what I saw was that as I began to work with some HPRP patients who had uh, on chronic suboxone treatment, was that if on the surface, their recovery looked very, very good. However, when they became off suboxone, almost all of them became relapsed from 50% relapsed on some drug, and the other 50% came real close to it. So there's something about being on suboxone um, that means that recovery is not quite as deep as it is when somebody's on an uh, abstinence-based uh, recovery program. So in summary, my experience, observations, literature says suboxone is addiction, produces euphoria, has a withdrawal syndrome associated with it. It's being abused. In 2014, there was a study in the Journal of Addiction Medicine which looked at people coming for suboxone prescriptions for the first time. So this is their first physician visit for for suboxone, 60% of those people had already gotten it off the street. That's a felony. It's being sold and traded on the streets for money or other drugs. You can take tablet forms, being crushed and used in, in intranasally or intravenously. It being, was being used to treat, uh, to beat drug testing, for example, for Asian drug screens. You take it for four or five days before your drug screen and you get back on heroin afterwards. Um, and then patients were continually calling in for early prescriptions. They, they were lost, they were stolen, the dog ate the medication, all those sort of things down the drain. Uh, and then patients were giving the drugs to friends and family members, which again is a felony under federal law. Some take home reflections that I had on this was that it was difficult to be drug free when you were taking an opiate. And patients often would take other drugs or drink on suboxone and think that they were in the trouble. Many patients would fail to engage in any recovery work regardless of how much prodding, pushing, motivation they had. Um, they seem to be satisfied with a quote unquote suboxone waking rather than a spiritual waking, which is a foundation of the inner true recovery. And I found that suboxone fundamentally changed my relationship with patients. I no longer was an ally or comrade on the road to recovery. In a certain sense, I had become very drug and the patients that did get successfully on the box and never got to make those that again. And at, uh, when we were using Suboxone at, at the Brighton Center for Recovery, um, one of the final straws was that we began getting requests for patients to help them get off Suboxone. At uh, Brighton, but, and I still am on staff at Brighton, so uh, we don't use it for chronic pain. It's an opiate. It's been shown to cause everything any other opiate does, including that opiate-induced hyperalgesia. Um, we don't use it long-term for treatment of opiate addiction. Well, we do find it has utility in detox. And I'm talking about three to five days of, of uh, suboxone use. Now, in the past, when I first started, the catapress was really all that we had, about one out of every two patients to walk out of treatment before treatment. Using Suboxone to um, detox from opiates is similar to using lithium or human barbitol to detox from alcohol. It's substituting a long-acting uh, drug or a short-acting one, one which is relatively non-eporogenic compared to the eporogenic drug. Uh, and using it in that way for the uh, acute withdrawal from opiates, about one in 10 people were walking out of the So that was, that's an improvement. And then you're, what you're of course, left with after the suboxone wears off is the post-acute withdrawal, which drags on depending on which drug you're using anywhere from 30 to 60 days. So that requires management, and that requires management of anxiety of in 
insomnia, uh, restless legs, uh, and any of the other symptoms of opioid withdrawal which kind of drag on for that whole long period of time. Now the last medication I'm going to talk about is this medication here. This is naltrexone. So it's here under group three. These are the pure blockers. Remember, naloxone is the one which reduces, which reverses the opiate blockade, uh, uh, opiates, and can be used to reduce reverse opiate overdose. Vivitrol is a single drug formulation that contains only naltrexone. Naltrexone is related to Narcan. It is not a narcotic. It is not a controlled substance. It does not produce euphoria and you can take it for five years and never have any withdrawal on the side. Okay. So it blocks opiates. In this form, uh, Vivitrol is administered once a month by injection. It's very expensive, probably about $1,200 a month. It does help to curb opiate cravings, and it's one of the few drugs which does so. Um, and it does so in the injectable form only. The oral tablet does not reduce cravings the way the injectable one does. And many people relapse when they stop taking it, which is the curse of medication-assisted treatment. Uh, most of the time when you're using medications to help in recovery, one of the things that happens is people think to themselves, I've made it, and we take them off the opiates. And in reality, you just really need to ramp your program up as if you're a newbie at that time and work real hard, because getting off medications, you're exquisitely vulnerable. So let's look at this wonderful Wizard of Oz, right? Okay. People have lost in the movie, right? Look at the date down here. 1900. What was going on in 1900? That's two years after Harold. So let's look. <laughs> Here's the heroes, right? There's Emerald City where they need to get to. What's this? Field of Happy. So here they are walking through the field. Now these are the genetically susceptible members of the company. <laughs> and they're beginning to feel the effects of the poppies, right? There's one down, <coughs> one going. And look at the look on his face. This poor codependent. <laughs> they're both down. So they appeal to a higher power okay, who intervenes miraculously with snow. And you get an awakening. Uh, you know, I, I'm just I'm just amazed at the parallels here. <laughs> yeah, this is about 50 years before Bill W. covered day A, right? And his 12-step method. Uh, eventually, she gets home after a lot of trials and tribulations, right? Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> and as far as I know, that's that's the best way for. Thank you very much. Thank you.